Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. We're glad that you took the time to, to hop on the call and, and many, many uh, citizen leaders from across the country to join us uh, here tonight. Um, for those that don't know, my name is Ben Gubitz, Associate Director over here at American Promise. And we have a very exciting agenda for folks tonight. And we're thrilled to have some special guests on the call as well. I know it's late for those of us, especially on the East Coast, so we're going to do our best to try to keep the call to about one hour tonight. And just so everyone knows, just a little bit of housekeeping, uh, everyone's on mute right now just to, due to the very high volume of uh, folks that have registered and, and people that have dialed in. Um, but if you press 1 on your keypad at any time, I'll be notified that you have a question or a comment, and, uh, and we'll do our best to, to call on you. So uh, I'm going to pass the call over to Jeff Clements here in just a minute. But as always, I like to kick off these calls with uh, an, an inspiring quote. Uh, this quote comes from uh, one of our friends and colleagues in this uh, work for democracy, Harvard professor Lawrence Lessig. And what Lawrence Lessig said was, we did a poll and found that 96% of Americans believe it important to reduce the influence of money in politics. But 91% don't think it's possible. That's the politics of resignation. But the politics of resignation gives you a perfect strategy for winning. How do we thaw that resignation? Because once we do, then I think we have a real chance of winning. And uh, as our good friend Sam Daly Harris, who I think is on the call, always says, if a, if a quote is worth reading once, it's worth reading again. So let me repeat that. We did a poll and found that 96% of Americans believe it important to reduce the influence of money in politics. But 91% don't think it's possible. That's the politics of resignation. But the politics of resignation gives you a perfect strategy for winning. How do we thaw that resignation? Because once we do, then I think we have a real chance of winning. And I just want to point out what, what you've done so far, folks on this call in this movement, is thawing that resignation. Whenever you talk with someone about the 28th Amendment in your community, you're thawing that resignation. And the National Citizen Uprising, what we're here to talk about tonight, will thaw that resignation so we can work uh, together and win this historic reform. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to our friend and colleague, Jeff Clement, President and Founder of American Promise, who's going to tell us a little bit about how the Citizen Uprising is getting started in communities all across the country and introduce our amazing guest speakers. So, uh, Jeff, go ahead and take it away. Hey, thanks, Ben. And uh, thanks to everybody for being on the call. It's really good to be with you. Uh, I, you know, I was thinking of that Larry Lessig quote last night. Ben and I were down in the, a big event for the Citizen Uprising uh, in South Coast of Massachusetts, and uh, we had 100% who thought not only it is important, but we must reduce the influence of money in politics. And if you want to go to our Twitter page at USA Promise, uh, you can see a photo of Ben and everybody in the room stand, is having their hand up, ready to step up to the citizen uprising. So we had no resignation. We had commitment. We had passion. So we were, we, we come to this call fired up by what we're seeing as we go out around the that country. Was a fun, and, uh, that was a fun event, Jeff. Yeah, it sure was. And that's the kind of thing we're going to be doing around the country and with the citizen uprising and, and hope you'll all be, find ways to step up and join us, whether as a, individual just coming to this or whether affiliated in local state or, or national organization this is inclusive this is for everybody who wants to help win the 28th amendment and we're going to talk about um, the uprising but as we do in the call and as we get towards the um, when we'll open it up for conversation with people on the call be thinking about how you might want to step up there are at least four ways uh, you can help organize a public event in your community the kind of thing we did last night and we'll be doing with our guest speakers, Ray Claire and down in Florida and um, Ken out in Wyoming and in Washington State, California, New Mexico, Minnesota, and elsewhere in the coming weeks. Uh, so if you want to do a public event, let us know. We'll, we'll help you get it going, and it's a great way to engage your community. Uh, if you want to go deeper and start up an American Promise Association, Ben will help you do that. Just connect up with him. Uh, you can use all our Citizen Action Center tools online, of course, at AmericanPromise.net. But we'll also be talking about 
a kind of mid-level step if you want to join the uprising. And, and uh, again, we'll talk about exactly what that means in just a minute, but we call it the Citizen Uprising Core Team. So listen for that, and that might interest you for how you want to get involved. So um, some of you were on the call uh, a few weeks ago. We had a huge number and a great turnout again tonight, so we're excited about that. Uh, but I want to uh, just go over again a summary of what the National Citizen Uprising is all about, what we mean when we say that. The idea is to move the 28th Amendment towards victory, but particularly to give every American a chance to be part of this and to make, if you will, a national referendum, a, a big bang of, about the 28th Amendment on Election Day in November 2018. And to do that, we're going to be teeing up ballot initiatives in several states. We're going to be teeing up uh, local ballot initiatives everywhere. We're going to be helping people uh, push 28th Amendment uh, resolutions through uh, state legislatures, local, county, you name it. We'll, we'll help, help do that. And we'll bring it all together uh, with a focus on uh, building an a increasingly uh, energetic, if you will, uh, campaign that uh, hits with November uh, 2018, bringing these together with candidate and and uh, representative accountability. Uh, we want to know where our candidates stand on the 28th Amendment to get money out of politics to give the people back our rights uh, and our government. Um, and we want to make we if ideally we'd want anyone who's running for office at any level uh, to have said where they stand on this, and we don't care what party they're from. Um, if, if they stand for the amendment, we stand with them, and this citizen uprising will help us do that and help us win this 28th Amendment, and we're very confident about the, the kind of response uh, and the readiness of the country to do this. So that shapes uh, that goal, that vision of what the citizen uprising is, shapes what we're trying to do uh, together, all of us on this call and beyond, uh, now, starting right now, and going out the next two years. So if you live in a state that has ballot measures, um, you know, like Maine and Massachusetts, Missouri, Ohio, Florida, many others, uh, we want to work with you um, about to help organize a ballot initiative for 2018 and uh, help you with resources in any way we can. Uh, if you live in a state that doesn't have the ballot initiative uh, and you haven't yet passed a statewide resolution, uh, states like Georgia, or Iowa, uh, Kentucky, Minnesota, others, um, then we want to help uh, be part of a big push to get resolutions through the legislature. We have 18 states already have stood up for the 28th Amendment. We want a lot more. Uh, if your town has not yet done a resolution, more than 500, actually more than 700 uh, towns and cities across the country have passed resolutions. But if yours has not, or if um, you're like many of the towns, it's been now four years since 2012 when many cities and towns did this, then we need to do it again, or we need to do it for the first time. And we'd love to see as part of the uprising, uh, 500 cities and towns across the country in every single state stepping up to do that. And uh, we'll be helping to do that. And so finally, um, in places uh, like Montana that has, uh, and Washington State and others, where they've passed ballot initiatives, they've, uh, they, they, they're, they're moving on from that to making the ballot initiative stick. And we call that getting the state ready to ratify. Uh, that when you've won the initiative, now it's time to get the state ready to ratify. And that means a lot of things, but it in particular means uh, having our elected officials uh, follow the strong will of the people that these ballot initiatives reflect. And we expect uh, all of our representatives, when we come together as Americans to pass 28th Amendment ballot initiatives by huge margins, uh, we will not give free passes to politicians who haven't taken a stand or who oppose the 28th Amendment. Um, and so that kind of accountability is uh, what we'll be looking to do. And uh, last month, uh, we heard, you may recall, from the award-winning citizen leader, Cindy Black, a good friend, and I think Cindy's on the call tonight, so good to have you here with us again, Cindy. But she ran the ballot initiative in Washington State with many others, great grassroots campaign to win I-735, and it passed uh, by wide margin, 
all over the uh, all over the state, uh, including Washington's eighth congressional district. So we've we've analyzed the results of that ballot initiative, and we're focusing on the eighth congressional district as as part of the citizen uprising, uh, because it's represented by Republican Congressman Dave Reichert, who has not yet um, decided or said that he supports the 28th Amendment. Uh, but every single county in his district voted in favor of I-735. His constituents, um, in many places by as much as 70% or more, voted for our 28th Amendment work. We need to let him know that, and we need to persuade him to support the amendment in Congress. So uh, we'll be going out there. Uh, I look forward to seeing Cindy and all the I-735 uh, men and Fix Democracy First team again. Uh, in just a couple of weeks, and we'll be b- building out a campaign and the work in the 8th District, uh, not not to attack, uh, but to win over uh, that Congressman Dave Reichert uh, to the views that his constituents already have. Um, so we look forward to that. Uh, and then the citizen uprising, of course, isn't just um, about winning ballot initiatives for the sake of winning them or resolutions for the sake of winning them or getting, you know, one or two Congress people here or there to support it. It's about winning the 28th Amendment. So when we do something like what I'm talking about in Washington State with uh, Representative Dave Reichert's district, um, it's with strategy in mind uh, that we believe we can get uh, Republicans, Democrats, independents on board this, this work. We must do that. Americans are already there. It's time for our political representatives to get there. And this is about winning the 28th Amendment and about turning our votes uh, as people, our will that we do with this uprising, into votes in Congress and state houses to pass and ratify the 28th Amendment. So that's what it's all about. Uh, We're really excited about it. People are uh, stepping up all over the country. You'll hear from a couple of them uh, tonight, uh, Ray Claire Johnson and Ken Chastek in Florida and Wyoming, as I said. And I'll be going uh, from Washington to California, where, the, the believe it or not, the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce is interested in hearing more about this and what local chambers might uh, be interested in hearing the business case, if you will, for the 28th Amendment, and there's a good one. Uh, and we'll be in St. Paul, Minnesota, and New Mexico, and, uh, as I said, Wyoming very soon. Uh, so um, we'll be inviting everybody to participate in this, no matter where you live, and you'll hear more about those specific steps, uh, the the ones I mentioned before, Uh, and uh, the Citizen Uprising core team calls will begin soon, uh, beginning next month. So if you want to step up in that way, it's a great way to get involved. Uh, There'll be two calls a month if you decide to join the Citizen Uprising core team, and uh, we'll usually have guest speaker and Q&A and sharing of strategies and grassroots victories in the local campaigns and connecting them up nationally so you'll know where you stand and what you're part of and and share uh, the best ideas. And uh, we'll have uh, actions of the month and trainings uh, so that we can all be uh, the best spokespeople for the 28th Amendment that we can. And then using our uh, technology tools like the conference call technology we're using tonight, we'll be able to break out then into Uh, on the same call, but break out into breakout groups, if you will, based on whether you're working on a ballot initiative or state uh, resolution in the state legislature. And so that'll be starting up next month. So stay tuned for that, and you'll hear more about how to connect and sign up for that. So uh, as I said, we're super excited about it, and we're grateful and excited to have uh, two of the citizen leaders who are stepping up to help lead the citizen uprising in their communities. Ray Claire Johnson, many of you may remember from the uh, National Citizen Leadership Conference and a a great friend and just a fantastic champion of of our our work together for the 28th Amendment and big reform. Uh, We'll share uh, what we're going to be doing in Florida soon. And then Ken Chestick, who's a professor of law at the University of Wyoming. I first met Ken a couple of years ago when I spoke about this work in Laramie and was really glad to reconnect with Ken, who's leading an effort uh, to get Wyoming to be 
the 19th state, um, and uh, I hope there's lots of contenders for that title, uh, but to be the, another state to get on to the uh, bandwagon for the 28th Amendment. So we're just uh, really delighted to have Ken and Ray Clare who join us. They'll each uh, speak for a few minutes, and then we'll open it up to conversation, Q&A, uh, uh, for them and for us, and uh, and then we'll come back and, uh, and, and, and hear more about how we can uh, actually step into the work of the citizen uprising, no matter where you live. So let me get, begin with Ken, who I already introduced, uh, professor at the University of Wyoming Law School, uh, a great citizen leader stepping in for this. So Ken, thank you for being with us and uh, take it away. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Can, can everybody hear me? Uh, we sure can. Yeah, loud okay, good. Okay, good. Um, so I'll, I'll start off, I'll just say a, a few words about why I got involved with this work and then focus more on, on what I'm doing right now and how I think there's a reasonable chance that we might get Wyoming to be the 19th state. Uh, it's, it's, it'd be great to have a deep red state on the list of, of states that have done this. Some of the states that have done it are kind of purplish, but none quite as red as ours, so I'd love to have us um, start off that trend. Uh, I got in interested in this issue the, actually the day Citizens United came down. I was driving home from work. I was living in Indiana at the time, and I heard on NPR, I heard the result, and I'm driving down the freeway screaming at the top of my lungs, it's the end of our democracy. It's the end of the republic, because it's such an obviously dis disastrous decision for democracy in, in, in our country. Uh, I've kind of had my eye on the issue. I've, I've done some research and working on it, but I was not really getting that involved with it uh, on the hopes that um, ultimately the Supreme Court might change and if we had some retirements of some of the conservative members, maybe we could get it overturned internally. Of course, that's out the window now that we have Scalia is gone and he's going to be replaced now by Trump. Uh, that's not going to help us any, any, in any way. So the only way really to get that citizen, that, that case overturned would be um, through the constitutional amendment. So about a year ago, um, I decided for a number of reasons, including this one, um, that I was going to run for the Wyoming legislature, House of Representatives. Um, so I um, went out and, 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 and put my name into the, into the arena, started running. This was one of the issues, among many others, that I was promoting uh, as I'm going around the, around the district campaigning for the Wyoming legislature. And I'm trying to keep a very positive campaign because um, that, that kind of works in Wyoming. People are, are friendly and, and get along and work together well. We have the Code of the West that requires you to, be, to respect your, your neighbors and help them out. So I'm trying to run a very positive campaign. My opponent, uh, who was, all, there was an open seat, so we have two newcomers, and we're both being very positive until I got a phone call from a constituent saying, why are you going negative? I said, what are you talking about? Well, it turns out a 501c4 organization, a, a PAC, a super PAC, um, put out a flyer supposedly supporting me um, by, by comparing and contrasting my position on an issue with my opponent's position. The problem was that the the, the Flyer completely misrepresented my opponent's position. And basically, he and I agreed on the issue. The issue was public lands. Both of us want to keep public lands in public hands. We don't want the federal government taking over public. Uh, we don't want the federal government turning over public property to the state. And we're both, we agree on that. Um, my opponent was a game warden who used to work for the state. And he wants, uh, he, he used, anyway. So, um, I had to go out publicly and disavow everything that this super PAC said about my opponent and try and, and – because I was getting a blame for it. The flyer, I saw the flyer later, it, it did actually have in very fine print the required language that says uh, this is not endorsed by any candidate or candidate's committee uh, and identified itself as a, as a 501c4 organization. But it's very fine print, nobody saw that. I got blamed for this negative ad. So I spent a fair amount of time trying to, and had to go to public forums when I was getting questions at public forums about this, and I kept saying, no, I didn't do that. It's not me. 
Um, so I was personally affected by um, this dark money um, that I had to run away from. I lost the election, which is not a big surprise because uh, I'm running in a Republican district as a Democrat, so it wasn't a surprise. But I got really irate about that having to do that. But also I got irate that um, when I started to see the kinds of nominees that the president-elect is putting into the cabinet um, where it is going to be corporatocracy. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, the corporate interests are really going to be totally in charge from the president on down. Corporations and corporate interests are overrepresented. They actually control the government at this point. And that's got to change. Um, we have, there's a lot of things that we need to do to solve problems in this country. We have a lot of problems that need to get solved. None of them can get solved until Congress responds to the people. And Congress will never respond to the people so long as they are owned by corporate interests. And uh, that's, uh, so I, for me, this issue is issue zero. You got to solve this one before you can solve any other problem. So I, um, within a few days after the election, I saw um, a flyer. I've, I've been kind of watching uh, a lot of these uh, groups that are working on this issue. I saw something that Jeff's group put out, and I wrote back and said, "Sign me up. Uh, I want to go to work in Wyoming and make this state the eight. That was going to be one of my signature issues. Had I won the election, I was going to drop a bill in the legislature to do that." Um, so what I'm doing now is I'm working with some of the other Democratic candidates who I campaigned with and met along the campaign trail. I've got one of them who's agreed to drop a resolution into the legislature to uh, try and get Wyoming to be the 19th state to call for a, con a, a constitutional amendment dealing with this issue. Um, and I. I'm actually going to ask my opponent to be a co-sponsor, since he was he was angry about this ad. In fact, the entire Republican Party took on the Democrats, uh, saying, "Look at these crazy ads you're doing. Uh, we need to investigate these Democrats for putting out these false ads." All right, good Republicans. Now you're mad about this too. Sign on to this amendment and let's solve the problem together. Is the approach that I'm going to take? I'm going to ask my opponent who beat me in the election to, to be a co-sponsor. Let's do this as a bipartisan issue. And because it did become a, a statewide campaign issue because of these, it, it wasn't just my campaign. There were a couple other campaigns that were doing the same kind of thing. The, the same group did the same thing in other districts. Uh, it became an, a statewide issue. And now I think um, we have an opportunity to say, uh, let's all agree that that should not have happened. And the way to prevent that from happening is campaign finance reform which means we need to, to solve the Citizens United problem. So that's going to be my first effort to try and get the legislature to uh, turn, overturn this. Um, Jeff is coming out here in, what, two weeks, a little, week and a half, Jeff, uh, where we're going to uh, put on a couple of public events, one at the law school, one downtown at the library. Uh, we're going to invite people to listen to what's going on and our strategy, get people signed up to start putting pressure on their legislators to vote in favor of this resolution that's going to be introduced. Um, so we're going to make a solid effort, a, a, a sincere effort at the statewide level to get the legislature to sign on. I, I'm a realist, and I understand that the chances of succeeding in that are not, they're below 50%. They're not zero. I think there's a chance, but not necessarily a good chance of doing that. So. But our legislature is a, a, is a two-month thing. Uh, this is the only month really in the next two years that we can actually do this, introduce this bill. Uh, so we're going to introduce it, work on it, and at the end of the legislative session, which ends in February, if this hasn't passed, we then cycle into phase two. We do have a citizens in initiative process in our Constitution, and we're going to start getting petitions out and going to start organizing folks to go out and get, get signatures on a petition to try and, and get this on the ballot in Wyoming. Because I think we have a good chance if it gets to, to the people, like Montana. It was an overwhelming win in Montana, and Wyoming folks are very much like people in, in Montana. 
our state constitution has some great language in it that, that says that the, the government is for the people. The people consists of human beings. It actually uses the word human in the constitution. So we've got some great language in our constitution, uh, which I think uh, we'll be able to use both during this legislative session, but if that fails during the petition drive afterwards, uh, and we're going to do the best we can to try and um, get this passed one way or the other. So, Jeff, that's all I wanted to say right now. I'm happy to answer any questions as we go forward. That that's fantastic, Ken. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's uh, really really exciting, um, and I look forward to seeing you out there and working with you on this effort. Uh, I'll also mention uh, that uh, former Senator Alan Simpson. Republican uh, from Wyoming, uh, a member of the American Promise Advisory Council and big supporter, while he couldn't join Ken and me, did uh, prepare a letter of support, which is really powerful, and uh, we'll be releasing that uh, closer to the event on January 23rd, uh, and we'll share that. We think it'll be a good resource uh, of, of showing Senator Simpson's leadership uh, on this issue and uh, help get uh, more Republicans on board as well. So thank you, Ken. Let me turn it over to our good friend, Ray Clare. Uh, great to have you with us, Ray Clare. Thank you. And uh, what's going on in Florida? Well, we tried the um, resolution route with our legislative body two years in a row, and we couldn't get anywhere with it. So we've started the ballot initiative process. Um, we're working with both Free Speech for People and American Promise to get that kicked off and the Stetson uh, Law School down here. Um, and the other thing we're doing at the end of the month, Jeff is coming down to join us, and we're going, it just happens that the Democratic Women's Club of Florida passed a resolution at their conference back in October in support of the resolution uh, and the amendment effort. So. It, here in Florida, they're just divided into nine regions, uh, and they have chairs for each. And so we're going to visit each of the nine regions and try to establish an American Promise uh, organization. And we're giving them two tasks. Uh, the first one is that they pass a resolution in each of their cities within 16 months and within the county in 20 months or 18 months. And the reason for that is we passed a resolution in St. Petersburg very, very quickly because the, com the council realized how important this issue was, and they're very progressive. The problem was that they did it so quickly, we, didn't, we weren't able to use it as a tool to educate the community, so most people didn't understand the importance of it or the value. So with these other communities, what we're more hoping to do is energize them to go out and meet in their communities and talk about this so that people understand how important it is that they get behind it. The other thing that we have working for us, and we've, we found a, a, a lot of response when we bring this up. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware, but Alec has formed a group now called ACE, and what ACE has been charged with is to do the same thing at the municipal level as they've done at the state level. And we've identified over 35 PACs that they've organized, the chambers have organized or we believe are going to embrace um, in the next election. And this means that home rule is completely out the window. And here in Florida, one of our hot issues has been fracking because our water table is so close to the surface and, and we have a huge shortage of water here. And we asked the state to pass a resolution. They had quite a, I mean, a, a legislation banning fracking, and of course they wouldn't do it. So then the town started doing it. And the other big ALEC movement right now is if a town or municipality passes something they don't like, then they're passing preemptive laws. And they've done that to us on fracking, gun control, um, one other, I've got a blank right now. But people are very aware of it, especially the fracking. And so between the ACE initiative and the preemptive laws dealing with fracking, these are things that are hitting people in their local communities, and we're going to build off of that to try to get the support for what we're doing. And we'll know more in, a, in about a month and a half or two months after we've made this trip to see if this strategy is going to work for us. Um, I encourage everyone to consider the ballot initiative because 
when you do that, the press picks up it, on it. They don't pick up very much on the resolutions. And we wasted basically two years um, trying to get that passed. And of course, we have a very Republican legislator down, legislative body down here. So we just basically got stonewalled. We went up and we spoke to every legislator or, so, or someone from our group did two years ago trying to support it and get it through. And they were beyond rude. <laughs> Now that things have changed a little bit, we're hoping that that is a little bit different. But one of the reasons we're trying to get this done in 20 months is so when 2018 rolls around, this is a major uh, criteria for choosing the candidates that they support and vote for, and that there'll be ones that support the amendment effort. So that's pretty much all that we're doing down here right now. Now the other thing is for you, all of you that weren't in Washington or in Washington at the conference. We're also uh, working with Free Speech and American Promise uh, and the League of Women Voters and a local foundation to um, pass an ordinance in St. Pete. And we're calling it the Defend Our Democracy Ordinance. And what it does is it um, eliminates super PACs and it eliminates any company that has foreign investors from contributing to campaigns which will eliminate a number of the, the large corporations or any company set up solely to be an influence in the elections. And if we're successful, we expect it to get challenged, and this will help cities all across the country because it will put a major dent, at least in the funding side of the issue. Um, we're proponents of we need a corporation as people, that doctrine eliminated too. And I think we can see from the number of people that Trump is putting on his staff and in key positions that corporations are taking over the country. And we believe this is the last step in the Powell plan and that if we cannot stop it, then we will be an oligarchy and turning it back will be very difficult. Because the other thing that we heard is 2 million students now have signed up to support the, Coke doc the uh, Alec Koch doctrine. And um, that's a, quite a critical mass. And here in Florida, the Koch brothers gave FSU, a Florida State University, $12 million. And in return for that, they have influence on hiring, firing, and, sit and designing their curriculum uh, in the College of Economics. And BB&T Bank did something similar in the College of Business. Their donation was $10 million. In return, they're requiring people to teach and the staff to teach Ann Rand. So in our whole university, our state university system, which consists of 12 colleges, um, <laughs> our boards are all controlled by ALEC members. So we have to expose this to people so that they understand what the core problem is. And the core problem is, in our opinion, an organized battle that's been going on under the table for years, and now it's finally just starting to come to light. But it's coming to light when so much damage has already been done and people are so burnt out that the challenge is to get them um, energized to get involved. And, of course, the last election is energizing more people than ever, at least down here. So we're hoping to have success when we bring these things to light uh, and get people involved with us. So I think, is that, did I cover great. everything, Jeff? Yeah, that sure did, Ray. Claire, thanks so much. And let's turn it back to Ben. Thank you. Thank yeah, you, Ray Claire. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, exactly. Thank you guys both for, for both joining tonight and for what you're doing on the ground. And we're going to turn it over for questions for our guest speakers. But real quickly, I'd just like to, I'd just like to emphasize what it is that, that Ken and Ray Claire are doing. These are uh, two people that, um, realize that there's a problem, uh, that there is a real threat to our democracy, and have decided to step up um, and do something about it. And it's really remarkable that, uh, that we're able to put these events together so quickly in Wyoming and Florida and in other places um, to kind of be the citizen uprising launch, you know, in that state. And that's exactly what we're looking um, for folks on this call and, and everywhere to do is, is if you're if you're willing to, to do um, you know a piece of what Ray Claire and, and Ken have done in setting up some public events, you know we'll come on out there and, and help you get started and, and help organize these events. So, anyways, enough from me. Um, I'm going to turn it over for questions. So, as I said before, if you hit one on your keypad, um, I'm going to I'm going to be notified that, that you have a question. 
and I don't want anyone to be shy. So go ahead and hit one on your keypad now if you have any question for uh, for Jeff or for Ken or for Ray Claire on on um, on these events or what's happening around the country and how you might be able to replicate some of the things that they're doing. Um, so go ahead and touch one on your keypad uh, right now if you have a question. <clears throat> And there was actually a couple seated questions before um, that we can get to that I hope we can get to. But first, we're going to go to Mark Garcia. And uh, Mark, go ahead. I'm just curious if you guys are um, backing at all the national popular vote, you know, nationalpopularvote.org. If you're um, backing their approach, at least you know, as a fix on um, getting away from the. Uh, the electoral college system until we can get an amendment passed for that. Uh, this yeah, is thanks. Claire. Oh, sorry. We, Go ahead, we Claire. are we are looking at that. Um, part of the ballot initiative, of course, is collecting the signatures, and we need percentage from the different counties. So one of the things that we're looking at is um, doing a ballot initiative to force that and a preemptive law initiative if we can handle all three because the the big issue is collecting the signatures. So if we can um, collect them for more than one uh, issue, we certainly would like to. And so we're looking into that, and that's one of the key areas that we're looking at is if we can do something on the Electoral College. The other thing yeah, I'd like to thanks. just mention, because I forgot it, the Constitutional Society is the balance to the Federalist Society. and. Every state has a chapter at their law school. And I would suggest that if you're considering doing something like that, you reach out to them um, because it's, a, it's an excellent resource. And our group down here is, tr is reaching out to the other uh, groups across the country to see if they can get something going as well. But if you're thinking about it, that's a good place to start because they can help give you some of the support that you need to get, it, to get things started. Yeah, thank, thanks, Ray Claire, and, and let me add, Mark, uh, just for benefit of people on the call um, who who may not uh, know about National Popular Vote, it's a it's a mechanism to um, have states uh, basically agree uh, to have their electoral votes follow the National Popular Vote in effect, um, ending the electoral college method. Uh, where uh, the national popular vote winner can actually not be the electoral vote winner uh, and uh, a, a minority winner a, who wins, uh, who gets fewer national uh, votes actually uh, becomes president as, as the electoral college um, mechanism um, allows and, and, uh, and, and, and contemplates. Uh, so, the answer to the question mark is, as Ray Claire suggests, we don't we don't tell uh, people what reforms they should do, uh, besides the 28th Amendment. Uh, as a national organization, American Promise is focused on building infrastructure, strategy, unity, all the supporting mechanisms we possibly can to advance the winning of the 28th Amendment. And one of the things we find is most um, effective. We all know there's many good reforms, and there's debate about those reforms. And we welcome that and encourage uh, people to pursue the reforms that they think are right uh, in addition to the 28th Amendment. Uh, but as a national organization, we don't um, take a position on, on uh, or we haven't taken a position yet on uh, other reforms, whether it's districting, citizen districting commissions or public funding of elections or popular vote or term limits or other uh, things that are proposed that may well be worthy reforms. Okay, yeah, I just great question, Mark, 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 where are you, Mark, where are you calling in from? California, Bay Area. California. Okay, great. And I know you wanted to pop in there real quick, Ken, but um, we got quite a few folks with their hands up, so if we can move on to the okay. next question, and we'll we'll let you feel that okay. way. Um, so let's go to Tina Desiree Bird. Tina, where are you calling in from? Hey, uh, Los Angeles. Um, Okay. Uh, the ACE, I actually, can you clarify for us because this ACE thing is fresh information for me. Are they a subdivision of ALEC or a separate organization that does funneling the dark money through? What's what's the whole thing on that? Can you get get into the weeds on that a little bit? Wait, Claire, you do you want to take that one? You mentioned ACE as the local uh, yeah. version of ALEC. Do you have any additional information? And Tina, I'll just say hello. A uh, 
I see you on Twitter. Hey, how are you? It's good to hear. Good to hear your voice as well. So I'm and, doing well. And Thank I would you. love to get involved on a. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I want to get involved with you guys on a deeper level. I think this is hugely important. This is, for as far as I'm concerned, this is the the only issue that matters right now. We can't fix yeah. anything else unless we fix the money in politics. And I think we saw today with the pharmaceutical vote. If it's not clear yeah. to everybody at this point that it's not money in politics, I don't know how bad it has to get. Yeah. Anyway, exactly. I digress. Well, well thank, thank you. Let me see if um, Ray Claire, real quickly, you could uh, shed any light on the ACE uh, comment that you had. Yes, ACE um, about three and a half years ago, or sorry, Alec three and a half years ago set up an ACE organization to do exactly what they're, they've done at the state level, at the local level. And at their last meeting, what they did is they told the, their chamber members that they should go home and start a PAC and mm -hmm. start embracing the ALEC strategy and enforce it or uh, embrace it at the local level. And we had two examples in the last election. One was in Gainesville, and luckily they did not uh, win the elections that they were supporting because it's a very progressive community, but the one thing we know about ALEC is that they stay at it and stay at it until they eventually do win yeah. and wear people down. And then the second one was down in south, southeast Florida, um, and they actually came into Pinellas County. Pinellas County, we are on the west side of Tampa Bay. We're Tam St. Pete, Clearwater, for people who know Florida. Um, we're the most densely populated county in the state, and we are being investigated right now by the federal courts because of the way our school board has appropriated money to the school districts. Um, it's very bad. And uh, they came yeah, in no, and this is very bad. They, they came in and backed uh, one of the school board members who's been on the board 19 years, who's definitely responsible for where we're at today, or at least one of the people. And she got reelected, even though a very strong person ran against her. So in our area, the PAC was very successful, and we believe that Freedom Partners is going to be a major party in the next election, and we think that that's why they're setting up all of these PACs. Now, we might not be right about that, but we think that that is probably going to be the next step for them. And what I can do is I can send yep. the information to a about ACE uh, to Ben, and maybe he can post it or send it out to everyone. Yeah, thanks, Ray Claire. Let's go uh, back to Ben, and thank you, Tina. Let's uh, stay in touch. <clears throat> ben, you there? Yep, I'm here. Um, so sorry about that. I was I was uh, muting myself. Uh, so we're going to do one or two more, uh, and I, I promise we'll have a little bit more time at the end to open up uh for questions if we don't get to everyone. Uh, but let's go to John Simpson if you have a question. John, where are you calling in from? I'm calling in uh, from Kansas City, Missouri. Mine is just a question about process. We've talked about these ballot initiatives and we've talked about legislatures uh, adopting resolutions uh, calling for, I assume, a convention. Are the ballot measures equivalent to a legislative vote to uh, call a convention? Or, or is that just a something to urge the legislature on and keep the heat on them? Well, I'll take that one. Uh, so thanks, and uh, hope you're involved in the American Promise Association in Kansas City with uh, Mike Dean and others. They're doing some great work out there. So uh, okay, yeah, the the uh, ballot initiatives and the um, legislative resolutions can be one of um, different approaches and different. States. So uh, some ballot initiatives have uh, called uh, and instructed, as Montana's did, their, um, and, and as Washington State just did, their legislators to get behind the 20th Amendment and move it, move it forward. Um, legislation, uh, re legislative resolutions can do the same thing. Uh, whether they call for a convention or not um, is really a separate issue. When the, eight, the 18 states I mentioned actually aren't focused on a convention call. Uh, there are other efforts, and I believe five states, uh, where the states have indeed uh, said we want a 28th Amendment and we want a constitutional convention to do it. Um, and there's uh, different different groups taking different positions on that. 
uh, as part of the citizen uprising, it's, uh, you know, that's up to the folks on the ground what is the right approach in their state, in our view. Um, and we're not getting uh, into the many interesting issues about an Article 5 or an amendments uh, convention, uh, but we certainly provide resources and platforms for those dis important discussions to happen. So the briefest answer to your question is with state ballot initiative, state legislation uh, for resolutions, local resolutions uh, are calling for the 28th Amendment. The mechanism for it, whether it's through Congress or or the, a constitutional convention is, a, is really a separate question. We want to make clear that the voters uh, want the amendment. Uh, we're, we're passing these resolutions, whether ballot or otherwise, to get the amendment. And we will be looking very closely at our elected representatives about whether they're in fact following the will of the people and moving an amendment forward uh, one way or the other. And if they're not, um, we'd like them to uh, get out of the way uh, so that we can get government back for for people, not money. Well, maybe we maybe we have to have to move them out of the way. Uh, you know, there's, um, find, find some good candidates uh, uh, to run against them and uh, keep the pressure on. And I I thank you. I think you've answered my question, and I I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Can I ask something really quickly? Yeah, Ken, go ahead. Or, yeah, was that yeah. So I, I'm the law professor here. So I, there are the the there are two ways to amend the Constitution. One, Congress proposes it to the states, or two, the states can, uh, if if a certain uh, two thirds of the states uh, call for a constitutional convention, then a convention can be called. Um, the first 27 amendments were all done by Congress. Um, so. That's the route that American Promise is going. That's the, the tack that we're taking in Wyoming is to get the legislature to call on Congress to do it. Um, I do fear that, that Congress won't do it. Um, so when we, if we go out, if we fail in, in our legislative efforts, when we go out on our petition drive, we're going to have a multi-purpose petition that says both uh, we need to have the, the state legislature do this, and if it won't, we are as as the citizens st speaking instead of the legislature, we are calling for a constitutional convention. Whether that's going to satisfy Article 5 or not is a live legal question. I think there's a good argument that it would, but there's still a question about whether the state initiative can take the place of the, of the legislature. Yeah. The word legislature is in, is, in, is in Article 5, and there's a live question there, which I think we have a good argument for, but that's a separate issue. Yeah, right. I, I agree. Thank you. Great question. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. And, and great questions. Thanks, thanks for everyone for, for a great discussion. Um, so we're going to try to open it up for some more questions at the end. I still see a, a number of hands in the air, and, and um, we want to get, uh, get on with the agenda and talk about some next steps, and we'll try to circle back uh, to make sure we get everyone. Um, but, but again, you know, just reiterating what Ray, Claire, and Ken were talking about um, in, in setting up these events, um, you know, we'd love to do something similar uh, in your own community to launch the Citizen Uprising, so, so let us know. And I wanted to circle back on, on a couple other things that Jeff was talking about at the beginning of the call. Um, next month, mark your calendars, uh, we're going to start a series of these, what we're calling Citizen Uprising core team calls. Um, and as Jeff mentioned, they're going to take place on the second and fourth Thursday of every month, the first one starting February 9th. Um, and the calls are going to be great. They're going to include guest speakers, a Q&A period. There's going to be sharing of grassroots victories, um, uh, nationally uh, a discussion of what that month's action might be, um, and, and very importantly, training on becoming better spokespersons for a 28th Amendment. So often we find that uh, many folks that might be interested in, in this issue and, and know that there's uh, a significant threat to our democracy, but don't necessarily have the chops to get out there and talk to their neighbors about it. Um, and that's certainly something that we recognize. And so part of this program is, is to, to, to provide a deeper structure of support and training um, so that we can all become better spokespersons for the issue. Um, and so, uh, so those are going to start, those core team calls are going to start next month, starting February 9th, 9th again, the second and fourth Thursday of every month. Um, 
And so just thinking about next steps, um, I wanted to get, make sure that we had time for questions in the end, and we have about 10 minutes left on the call. But in terms of next steps on, on kind of where we go from here, this call was the first step. You guys have all joined the Citizen Uprising, so congratulations. Um, and, if, and if this vision sounds right to you and, and, and you want to get inspired and, and do a little bit more, uh, we need people and organizations in every state to help launch the uprising in your state. Um, we're launching in many states, as, as Jeff was, was just talking about, but we need to launch in, in many more um, and setting up a, and, and there's a number of ways to do that, including events um, and starting American Promise Associations. Um, and so really some of the key ways that we can get involved here is to, number one, uh, join a core team. And what a core team will do is they'll, they'll get involved uh, with the monthly actions. They will participate in the, uh, in the bi-monthly conference calls. They will get together with their group uh, two times a month and figure out how to drive that initiative forward depending on what state they're in. Um, another way to get involved is to, to launch a new American Promise Association in your community. This is a little bit deeper structure of support that, that takes a little bit longer to get going um, outside of the core teams. Um, there is rigorous training. Uh, there is, um, you know, a, a series of steps to get involved that I'd love to talk to anyone about that's interested in launching something like that. Um, and so what we're going to be doing is I'm going to be sending out an email um, as a next step that has these next steps laid out very clearly. And you can uh, fill out what we send to you and let us know how you want to participate in the Citizen Uprising. So look for that. That's going to be coming in the coming days um, to everyone in this call. And then, um, and then step number three, join us on the, on the next call on February 9th as we launch the Civic, Civic Uprising 14 calls. Um, and, uh, and again, <laughs> I, just want to, I just want to mention that if you uh, – if you had any trouble joining in on, uh, on the last call, um, we now have an unlimited uh, capacity for these conference calls and, and we'll continue to have for our core team calls. So feel free to invite as many uh, friends as possible. You'd be amazed at how many uh, folks reached out to me in the last couple of days and said, hey, you know, I have, I have some friends that want to join but just want to make sure that they can jump on. I just want to let everyone know that, yes, they can absolutely jump on. We hope that they'll join these core team calls starting next month. Um, and so be looking out for an email from me, more details about that, and further instructions on how to get involved. So we have about eight minutes left. I want to do a few more questions and then kick it over to Jeff to wrap up. Um, there, again, there are a number of hands in the air, and uh, we're going to try to get to everyone. I don't know if time will allow, but we're going to do our best. But let's go to Jeff Newman. Jeff, where are you calling in from? Yes, I'm calling in from Los Angeles, and uh, I had a question. It was off of something that Ray Claret said about outreach to colleges and, and uh, curricula development. And I was wondering if we had any um, efforts in regard to uh, curricular activity in, in regard to history, you know, and, and specifically on a national level, specifically around what happens in the textbooks that go through Texas. Uh, because, you know, the millennials are going to have a continued uh, responsibility and impact and uh, basically carrying the ball as things go forward. So uh, that's my question. Well, this is very clear. One of the things I would suggest is look up a group called Uncook My Campus. And um, these are students who are leading the effort to get a, a Coke initiative going on their campus to find out how pervasive the Coke Alec um, influence is there at, uh, on their campuses. A group, um, Center for Media and Democracy, helped fund some of the research or a lot of the research that was done that uncovered what's going on here in Florida. And so they do have a pretty good idea of what's going on in many states. And when I said reach out, the, the, if they have an Uncoke Our Campus, that's a good place to start. But the Constitutional Society would be associated with your law school, and they would be the ones to help you most on a ballot initiative and things like that. Now, I know it changes from school to school, but most of the schools have a requirement that the students have to put in so many pro bono and um, community service hours. So if you have a good project, then they will get credit for it, and hopefully they'll get energized by the project and stay with it um, 
you know, as supporters as you move forward. So those are the two places that, that I would would focus. Um, and then, yeah. of course, the other thing for the students, if you can get directly to them, now here in Florida they have done all they can to block students from demonstrating uh, in a number of different things that we're also trying to work on. But um, to make, try to find a group on campus, and normally we're finding that we're not having much luck here with the student governments, but other organiz campus organizations, and try to find a couple students that will understand the issue and be willing to get involved with it. And the, the hot button for a lot of them is the um, student debt issue. And if they can understand how it ties into this whole corporation control issue and the Coke issue, ALEC issue, and how they're trying to take over the campuses, it's not a very difficult sell to get students interested in doing something about it. The, the challenge always is, is finding a student leader that is willing to take it on and that's organized enough to do something like this. Yeah, that's that's quick, Claire. The, yeah the other um, thing I would add real quickly, if you're – uh, in, in an American Promise Association or thinking about starting one, uh, we have a Civic Courage program, which is about the curriculum issue, about how you know what what our our students are learning in our local schools. Uh, we have Ella McGrail on our National Advisory Council. She's a 17-year-old high school student, just a remarkable uh, person. You can see her video on our on our web page and in our local. Like many of you, I volunteer as a uh, in our local American Promise Association, we put on events at the high, local high schools, and uh, we can help you do that as well to bring civics back in to the schools. And uh, it, 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 we were talking to a high school teacher, retired history teacher last night, also very interested in kind of rebuilding the civics curriculum in America. So it's a great question, an urgent issue, and uh, thanks for raising it. Yeah, great question, Jeff. Can I just uh, make one more? Can I make one more quick uh, comment? Quick, quick um, comment. <laughs> okay. Well, one of the things you need to watch out for: we have a new school that opened here, and they called it a civic curriculum, but it was written by the Koch, the Koch Foundation, and it's a public school, and people did not understand it because everyone thought we should get civics back in our ed education process. And it's a magnet school for civics, but the civics program is the Coke program. So yeah. watch so for we, it in your keep, community. Yeah, people want civics back in the schools, so we we better we better bring real civics back, and that's that's the work we need to do. Thanks, Ray Claire. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so let's go over to Desiree Golis. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Hi, Desiree. Where are you calling from? Hi, I'm calling from Washington State. And I was just wondering, since somebody brought it up when it comes to members of Congress that wouldn't go along with this, if there was any kind of partnership with brand new Congress or if that was something that we should look into as well along with Citizen Uprising. And I know we passed I-735 here, so wondering about that. Yeah, we had some folks from brand new Congress who came to our National Citizen Leadership Conference, and I think there are many uh, effective partnerships at the local level um, mm -hmm. from brand new Congress to many others in terms of uh, uniting our, our work uh, to get the kind of representation that uh, Americans need and that can help pass the 28th Amendment. So I think if, uh, if folks uh, know of... Uh, volunteers or organizers with brand new con Congress who want to get involved in this work and uh, find ways of collaborating. I think it's just a great idea. Okay. And, and, De and Desiree, I hope you plan on attending the event. I'm not sure where in Washington you are, but uh, mark your calendar for January 25th in Auburn, Washington, and we can send you uh, the details about that event. Um, this is to, to launch the campaign to get Congressman Dave Reichert on board that, that Jeff was speaking about before. Okay, yes, I would like the information on that. Wonderful. Yeah, we'll send we'll send your way, absolutely. So we have one minute left. Um, I do apologize to folks that we weren't able to get to your questions just yet, and, and to the ones that sent in questions beforehand, uh, we will do our best to get back to you on those as well. But if you do uh, want to send me an email, uh, we'll make sure to get your questions answered. It's beng 
at AmericanPromise.net. Again, it's Ben G at AmericanPromise.net. If you have a question we weren't able to get to you, send it my way, um, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. So with that, Jeff, I'm going to send it over to you uh, to wrap up, and, and I just wanted to personally thank everyone for joining and, and looking forward to working with each of you uh, on this uh, historic path to the 28th Amendment. So go ahead, Jeff. Thank you, Ben, and thanks again to everybody. Uh, we will wrap up. We're heading into uh, Martin Luther King's uh, holiday weekend uh, with Martin Luther King Day on Monday. We'll certainly be honoring it at American Promise. And I want to close uh, with uh, one of the many, many points of inspiration uh, from Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and uh, Dr. King said this uh, that we may find resonates again today. Human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Even a superficial look at history reveals that no social advance rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. Every step towards the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle. The tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. Without persistent effort, time itself becomes an ally of the insurgent and primitive forces of irrational emotionalism and social destruction. This is no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. That's Dr. King. He, I think those words uh, resonate, as I said, so much today in our call for our action. Uh, I'm going to read it one more time and, and we'll close. Human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Even a superficial look at history reveals that no social advance rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. Every step towards the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle. The tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. Without persistent effort, time itself becomes an ally of the insurgent and primitive forces of irrational emotionalism and social destruction. This is no time for apathy or complacency this is a time for vigorous and positive action. If you're on this call, if you're joining the Citizen Uprising, if you're involved in this work, as I know you are, uh, you get that, that this is not a time for apathy and, or complacency, and you're inspiring us. And you see it's a time for vigorous and positive action. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll be doing vigorous and positive action together, and I'm very grateful for that. So look forward to seeing you out on the road around the country with these events and I look forward to talking again soon and working with all of you. So thank you very much. Thanks again to Ben. Thanks again to Ken and Ray Claire for coming on the call and sharing your knowledge and wisdom and inspiration with us all. And until next time, take care.